So with the release of War for the Planet of the Apes, they have completed this current trilogy of films, and we now have nine Planet of the Apes movies spanning 49 different years. Now, to me, this is one of the more interesting movie franchises of all time in that it's kind of the original modern day movie franchise. I wrote an article about it. I've got a link in the description down below. But when the first film came out, the idea of doing five movies and then a TV show and then a cartoon and then rebooting it and rebooting it again and doing a prequel, all the stuff that they did with this series that's fairly common to do with franchises now wasn't really how they did things. It was a very new, cutting edge, ahead of its time film franchise, which is very fascinating to me. And it's also a very inconsistent film franchise. And then some of the movies are incredible and some of them are not. Some of them are really, really bad and very, very blah. So with all that said, let's go ahead and dive in and look at how Rotten Tomatoes, what the critical consensus of these movies is. And this one's a little bit tricky because the original series of films was before the modern era of criticisms, and so there aren't nearly as many reviews for them as there are for the current films. But anyway, is some sort of idea of what critics have thought about each of these films. Coming in at ninth place is Battle for the Planet of the Apes with 38%. Coming in at eight is Beneath the Planet of the Apes with 41%. Coming in at seven is Conquest of the Planet of the Apes with 44%. Coming in at sixth is Planet of the Apes 2001 with 45%. Coming in at number five with a big jump up is Escape from the Planet of the Apes with 78%. Coming in at number four is Rise of the Planet of the Apes at 81%. At number three is Planet of the Apes 1968 with 90%. It's tied with number two, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which also has 90%. And in first place from the critics is War for the Planet of the Apes. Now, of course, War for the Planet of the Apes just came out, so critic scores are still coming in, so that might go up or down a little bit. But with the number of critical scores that have already come in, it's very unlikely that it will drop down to 90 or below 90. So its place in history it probably will be the best reviewed on that binary thumbs up, thumbs down scale of the Planet of the Apes films. Before I get started, be sure to put your ranking down below in the comment section. I don't want to just talk about these movies. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Get some discussion going on down below. And if you haven't seen all of them, rank whichever ones you have seen. Let's get some discussion going. And to that point, also, I worked on an article with uh, Griffin from Men vs. Movies as well as Tyler Tompkins over on Men vs. Movies where each of us ranked this modern trilogy of films as well as the original Planet of the Apes movie just to see some different perspectives on how each of us thought about each one of those ranks and different ideas on it because that's what I like is the discussion on how we all see the same movies but we see them very differently in different movies plots uh, characters resonate with each of us differently so some different thoughts on it and as I said put your ranking down below in the comment section with all that said let's go ahead and get started with my list coming in at number nine is beneath the planet of the apes now this is the second movie in the series and to me it is a classic example of how you don't do a sequel. It picks up where the first film ended, but in kind of a rehashy kind of way. It shows you what happened in the previous films. You get a little glimpse of what Charlton Heston has been up to with Nova. And then it shows a new spaceship, just like the previous spaceship, crash on the planet. Three astronauts, some of them die. I mean, just very much similar to what the first film started with. Likewise, the beginning of the plot is people wandering in a desert, just like the first film. And then once the plot gets going, once it stops being just kind of a rehash, and by rehash, I mean the guy they cast to replace Charlton Heston, who I guess didn't want to star in the second one. I don't know exactly what the backstory is there, but he's only in it you know, for like five minutes. Then this new guy takes over, and he looks just like Charlton Heston. I mean, he just looks like Heston, exactly like him, just a few years younger, the new studlier version of him. But then the plot gets going and moves away from the rehash and it just it just gets stupid. There's people worshiping a nuclear bomb. There's effects of like fire and walls that people can fall through. It's things that just, they just don't make sense. They don't add up. It feels out of place compared to what we saw in the previous film, the world they established there. The ideas aren't good. It's boring. The social commentary is so heavy handed with the nuclear war type stuff and people worshiping, literally worshiping a bomb that uh, I, it's not watchable. It's not good. It's the perfect example of what sequels shouldn't be. 
And so this one comes at the bottom for me. Sorry for the interruption. I wanted to talk about the single biggest thing you can do to support my channel, and that's to become one of my official patrons by supporting me financially directly on my Patreon page. If you do that, you get kind of special influence into my page in that I ask my patrons every month, what movie would they like me to review? What subject do they want me to address in a video? And essentially they get a personalized video made directly for them each month. I also give them special influence into my future projects I'm working on, give them shout outs, and like in this video right here, I put a list of their names up on the screen because I want to support their channels as well. So if you'd be willing to support my channel because you're a big fan of what we're doing and you want me to continue doing this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. With all that said, let's continue. Coming in at number eight is gonna be Battle for the Planet of the Apes. On a quality level, these two to me are kinda, kinda right there on the same spot. And eight is kind of more forgettable to me. There's, if there aren't things in it that are as so overtly like bad ideas that I was just like, what are you thinking? But as a production, it's a cheaper production and there's a significant number of issues with it. You, there's parts where you can tell that they're just putting masks on people, things like that. You're watching a sequel to Planet of the Apes and you can tell it's just like a rubber Halloween mask. And there's scenes where there's like crowds of people and you can see which one have the professional makeup and which ones have rubber mask on. I mean, that's the level of movie you're talking about here. And the ideas on it aren't very good and they're heavy handed once again that hu the humans have started to kill each other off with nuclear wars. The apes are starting to take over and Caesar's trying to seek out video of his parents from a forbidden city. Just you can tell that they're running out of places to go, social commentary to make, and you just have more Planet of the Apes. You're seeing Caesar rise up. They're trying to transition to how you get to Planet of the Apes, but it, it just doesn't work. It ends with kind of a bookend telling the legend of the people that sets up some of the world that you see in the first film, but it's not a good bookend to the series. It's not a good movie. And the only reason to me it's above battle is it's just a little bit more interesting and there's a battle and how the pieces fit together. And so it's slightly more interesting, slightly more memorable, but not really, not really. These Like those bottom two are bottom two. They are way far down. Moving up from there, we've got two that are not good. They're a little bit more, they're watchable bad to, to me though. Coming number seven for me is Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. I rewatched this one last night. I thought I remembered liking this one more. And while the plot of this one doesn't really tie into the modern trilogy of apes films, there's kind of some cross points in the Rise of Caesar type of thing. But rewatching it, it it's so heavy handed and on the nose. There's so much expository dialogue in it that it's it, it just it feels like a cheap sequel trying to build up to where we were at before or following what came before and uh, to give us a movie version of events that they talked about in the previous film. But it's handled so poorly. I mean, the movie starts off in the first five, six, seven minutes of it is just trying to explain to us what happened in the previous film and what the world is like right now. So it's just Caesar rock, walking around with Ricardo Montalban being like, why can't I talk to people? And him going, because if they knew who you were, they would know that your parents were the ones and you were the child that lived that they thought they killed because you could be the only child or talking ape. It's just like, oh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing expository dialogue? This is this is not how you do movies. This is, I, I, yeah, this you're supposed to show things, not tell us things. And then as the story progresses, the actual like inciting incident that kind of leads to the drama of the story isn't convincing. It's it's Caesar does something he shouldn't do. And it's very awkward and clunky the way it happens. The world they set up, I think it's 1991 or 1992 is the timeline, which is funny now because over 25 years ago. But it's like this totalitarian world where all dogs have died. And there's a scene where when this is explained to Caesar and they're standing in front of a statue of a dog and it says Rover on it. Um, <laughs> watching it was like, really? <laughs> That's what they're doing in this one? Um, and then Caesar rises to power in this one, frees the apes, and there's riots and stuff. And there's heavy handed slavery imagery throughout the whole thing in that because all the dogs died, they make apes the new pets, but then they don't want them just to be pets because they realize they can be trained. And so then they're treated as slaves and they're mistreated like slaves. And so there's a black guy in the movie that's the human that's supposed to sympathize with the apes. 
in very, very on the nose, direct slavery comparisons in all of this. And the movie ends with Caesar wanting to go overboard and is being brutal in his rebellion against mankind and trying to hurt them. And a black guy trying to talk him down from doing this. And, uh, and I mean, it's just, it's so heavy handed. It's tackling it in such a way that's clearly addressing issues of the day and civil unrest and real issues that need to be addressed, continue to have issues in society today that need to be addressed, but done in a way that's so over the top and preachy in such an odd way. And the Caesar in this one is not the really cool Caesar that we have in the modern trilogy. Um, he's much more one note, one dimensional and not as noble as as our current Caesar that we know and love. So this movie, I, I thought I was going to like it more than I did. And I, I did not care for it. Coming in at number six is Planet of the Apes 2001. Now, I rewatched this one just a couple days ago. I saw it in the theater when it first came out and was like, what did I just watch? That was that was not good. And then history's not been kind to it. People have crapped all over this film for a long time. You know, one of Burton's worst, terrible remake and little scenes from it being shot, you know, as memes on the Internet and stuff like that, because they're so weird out of context. Overall rewatching it, it's still not good. It's not as bad necessarily as I remember. It's just a, such a weird, weird misfire of a movie. It's by far the least Tim Burton of Tim Burton's movies, which is odd because by that point in time, he was quite powerful, quite prominent. They gave him tons of money. And you watch this movie and there's almost no Tim, Tim Burtonisms in this movie. It's just generic early zeros, blockbuster kind of based off Planet of the Apes. I mean, just it, it is it is generic as can be. So they get Mark Wahlberg at a point in time in his career where he was just generic leading man guy like Mark Wahlberg. Now I really like him, but he, back then I didn't pretty take the care for him. Looking back on it, he hadn't grown into who he is today. He wasn't as strong as an actor and he wasn't as charismatic. And the character as written is not very compelling at all. The social commentary of the original film and really the original series as a whole is just sprinkled on there just a little bit, but not enough to be saying anything. There's just a few moments like humans need to be treated better. That's it. That's kind of as far as they go. They try and put twists. There's a couple of different twists in the movie. There's like three twists in the last 40% of the movie as to kind of where the apes came from and the humans on the planet. And then there's a twist in the middle of the final panel. And then there's the final twist at the very end of the movie that makes no sense at all. Um, but all of them feel like, let's try and outdo the Statue of Liberty twist. We can do this. None of it, none of it really works for me and what they're trying to do. Um, but it's, it's not nearly as bad as I remember. The Michael Clark Duncan and... Tim Roth is the villain apes and gorilla are really good. They're scary. The makeup looks incredible. Um, it's a I would say it's a pretty well structured movie as a blockbuster of the day. It sets up kind of some intro level action. Then there's kind of an escape setting up to a third act big battle. So it's nicely structured. It's coherent. You can follow what's happening. It makes sense. There's some dimensions and tension to it. So where it, it, it almost feels like it's much better. And I was even talking to Tyler Tompkins. He actually he seemed to like it a good bit more than I did. But it, it just feels like such a it's like an odd, just the wrong mix of everything. So, like I said, the makeup looks great and there's apes that are talking but then the way it's lit and that the whole movie feels like it's on sound stages, which are, it has to be. It has to be all on sound stages. It doesn't look green screeny. To it. There's a few things that are green screeny, but for the most part, it's not green screeny. They're on actual sets, but they just feel like they're in a studio the entire time. And it's lit so fully that it, it just looks cheap, even though the, the makeup's astounding. The production design is quite good, but it doesn't look as well as it should. Like stuff like that. That it's just a misfire on a level like what? Why does it look like this? This it should look so much better and more expensive than this. And throughout the whole movie during the action, the apes are able to like jump really high and they're really strong. And so the whole movie, people are like up on wires flying and jumping around and it looks like people on wires. The gravity of it doesn't work quite right. And so you just feel the nice smoothness of uh, someone on wires rather than the pull and fall of gravity. 
and it's the whole movie. So that's all these little things that throughout the whole movie that feel like that, that are just off and weird and misfires and ideas that aren't as good as they should be. So overall, not as bad as I remembered it. Not as bad as it's, if this wasn't, if it wasn't called Planet of the Apes, if you took Planet of the Apes off of this and you took Tim Burton's name off of it and it was just generic sci-fi movie from 15 years ago, it would be forgettable because it's generic, but I don't think people would pick on it nearly as much as they do. But when you put Tim Burton's name on it, it's like, why does this Tim Burton movie suck so much? And when you put Planet of the Apes on it, you go, this is embarrassing. This is not good enough for the source material and the social commentary that this series has kind of stood for before. And you should do better than this. Coming to number five is going to be Escape from the Planet of the Apes. In some ways, this is kind of like the lightest film in the series in that the first half of the movie or so is kind of a fish out of water, not full on comedy, but a very jokey type story where some of our apes escape the Planet of the Apes, hence the title of the movie, come to, not present time because it's back in the early 70s, but present time of around when the movie came out, and it has them living as talking apes in 70s America. And you get lots of humor in this in comedic situations that certainly were not the basis for the previous films or the films since then, while at the same time the story still had the exploration of the ideas of fear, consequences, bigotry, prejudice, and cruelty towards other creatures that you see throughout the series. And all this makes it a very interesting entry in the series. And of course, the idea of it being kind of the one where you take the characters from that setup of the original Planet of the Apes and now bring them to modern world, that's just interesting in and of itself. But then it also has many of the problems of the other films in the series at this point in time, or really of the entire original franchise of feeling very dated in the way it communicates stories. It feels at times like we've got the budget has been trimmed down a little bit. And there's just sort of things in it that just really surprising that this is the direction they went with things and how story elements played out early on. There's uh, one of their apes that went back in time with them, gets killed by a grill, and it just, it just kind of happens. Like, it just kind of plays out, and you're like, what? Did that really just happen that suddenly, that quick? What? Really? That That's what we're doing with that? And then the story moves on. It was just a plot point to move things forward. There just seemed like sloppy and weird storytelling and writing and the way it, the way it was handled. And then likewise, the plot reasons for why certain things happen uh, as you go throughout the story um, just, just feels like, oh, they gave her alcohol and she said a little bit too much. And that led to them doing to, uh, overreacting and they heard things they didn't want to go. This doesn't feel very compelling as we're trying to tell the stories we're trying to do. But at the same time, in the ways that uh, uh, the first film had a, some cleverness in the writing of it, and the twist ending type stuff, this one has some of those elements to it that work pretty nicely and have the drama and surprise and twists and turns and unexpected in the darkness that's always been in the series. So, Weird mix of ups, downs, lefts, rights, all of the above in the way all it, all of it kind of comes together. But it's nice to see Ricardo Montalban in it. Of course, I'm a Star Trek II Wrath of Khan fan, so seeing Ricardo Montalban is a very pleasant surprise. But as for a movie, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag of good and bad. It looks cheap. It feels cheap. It's got some really good ideas. It is pretty funny at times, but overall, I... I can only kind of recommend it. I can't full-blown recommend it as a really solid movie because it feels so dated and low budget. Now there's a big gap between here and my number four, but I mean like a big gap. So you got a couple at the bottom that are just, they're just, they're bad. They're not good. I, I didn't like them, enjoy them. Then you got two that are kind of, I mean, they're watchable, but they're not really good. Then you jump up and you, you get some really, really good movies at this point. So coming in at number four for me is going to be Planet of the Apes, 1968. Now, aside to me wants to be like, wants to impress you with how snooty my taste in movies are and try and push this one up higher. It's a classic film. It's an important film. It's an influential film. Like I talked about, this one set up kind of the original modern day movie franchise. But at the end of the day, it really has not aged well. Now, there's sides to it that are pretty good, and the script was worked on by Rod Sterling of 
uh, Sterling of the Twilight Zone fame. And so you can feel that in there, that this eerie, something's off, there's a mystery, what's going on, the big twist ending. All of that is very Twilight Zone-y. So that's pretty cool that, you know, we have a movie like this that you, you sometimes forget that Sterling's involvement in it. And when you rewatch it with that in mind, you go, yeah, that makes a ton of sense that this would be from the guy that gave us the Twilight Zone with all those twist endings and social commentary. And this kind of feels very much so like a feature length episode of the Twilight Zone. And that's a big compliment. That's a, that's a, when I say that, it's meant very much as a compliment. Um, and, and tackling some things in some interesting ways, of course, uh, Charlton Heston gives a very, charismatic leading performance and there's some intrigue in it and some interesting ideas and it's it's an interesting one to watch but it feels just as old it is as it is maybe even kind of older and for several different reasons first off right out of the gate the movie starts off and there's some special effectsy type stuff and then Heston goes into a monologue about his worldview and his beliefs and the mission that they're on, explaining the science of what's happening and establishing the mystery sorts of things that are going to happen in the movie, which if you understand that this has connections back to the guy that did the Twilight Zone that started off with a guy doing monologuing at the beginning, this opening scene makes a little bit more sense. But watching it in today's context with how movies have developed, cinematic storytelling telling has developed, you watch it now and it's not good. You can't get, a, you couldn't get away with this. If this came out today with, and just even you upgrade the special effects and you did this today and a movie starts off with a guy giving an expository monologue, establishing his belief system and the themes of the movie, you would not give this a good review. Then the movie gets going into the plot, they end up on the planet, and it's 30 minutes of them walking through a desert, talking about their beliefs, him with the other survivors, just talking about why they left the earth and their thoughts on things and all, all sorts of exploring ideas. It's all expository dialogue, uh, mostly expository dialogue, heavy handed, heavily on the nose. And the pacing is thing seems so far off because it's 30 minutes that goes on so long before it feels like the movie gets going. And, and I checked it. It's 30 minutes before the apes show up and the apes show up in their big action sequence. And then this leads to a section of the movie where Heston's like he's captured and he's got not tortured, but uh, not treated particularly well. He escapes. He's put on trial and it moves really quick. Uh, kind of for the rest of the movie. So that really uneven pacing and the way it's handled. And, uh, you know, when he's on trial, once again, so on the nose in the way it handles the ideas on faith and evolution and the rationalist versus the person, um, the traditionalist, all of these things just on the nose stated overtly this character is a person of faith this person is a person of reason we're exploring ideas of evolution and we're stating it overtly the phrases that people are using in society right now just reversing them with apes in the mix so heavy-handed and that's kind of where the movie ends it just and i and i say all this to not say this is a bad movie. This is a very good movie. It's a movie you should watch if you haven't watched it yet. But even as a classic, it's it's a movie that I it 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 just does not hold up as well as it should. I mean, I'd still give it like an eight out of ten because it is interesting. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. But its age shows the way movies have are made has changed. The way we use the cinematic form has changed. And this one feels like a thing of the past. Coming in at number three is going to be Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And at this point in time, we're talking about movies that I, I love. Um, I, I mean, I just love all three of these movies. And depending on my, like every, each time I rewatch Rise, I go, maybe this one's my favorite. Like all three of these ones, I'm guessing throughout time, I'm going to go, maybe I, I do like this one better. But at the moment, at number three is going to be Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I didn't want to go see this movie when it came out. Uh, I... It didn't look interesting. It looked like another cheap remake, reboot, requel, prequel, whatever it was going to be. And then I finally watched it and I loved it. Just the way they're doing storytelling in these in that they did a, a, a big blockbuster. There was a tragedy that it was sad that 
it had real conflict where you understand, like you have uh, Franco's characters trying to save his father's mind so he can keep his father longer and keep him alive. And because he's so desperately trying to save his father, he does things he shouldn't do. He cheats things he should not cheat. And this leads to consequences. Um, uh, in the movie, the greedy businessman shuts him down when things look risky, but because he's greedy, he greenlights things when he sees results. And so these are character flaws for people that aren't just mustache twirling villains that are evil. They're humans. Even Tom Felton, Malfoy, Draco, uh, Draco Malfoy from Harry Potter, even him as the evil guy, if you if you don't know, if you're watching this just as guy that works at a zoo, we all know, we know people that work at zoos and shelters or other places that are just jerks like this character. In it. He's not a sociopath. He's just a, not a nice guy that he does not know that the ape he's being mean to has the intellect and complexity of thought of a human. And all this leads to just complex characters, interesting situations. And there's no... The conflict of it is competing values, miscommunications, people not knowing that Caesar is has an intellect that it's not possible for him to have, but he has it. Things like that that create the scenarios in it. This was such a surprise, so fun. They found a way to have a finale. And I went into it thinking, I mean, how are they going to have apes like kill all the humans in this movie with this battle in the Golden Gate Bridge? This doesn't make any sense. This is going to be stupid. And that's not what the end was at all. That's not what the movie was. It's not about Franco. Like I was like, I was kind of annoyed with Franco at the time. I was like, I don't want to watch a Franco movie. It's not a Franco movie. He's a B-level character in this movie. The first act, he's co-leads in it. And for the rest of the movie, he is on the back burner. And this is Caesar's story. And you don't, you get annoyed when it cuts over to Franco in the movie. That's one of the flaws of it, that you don't want to watch Franco. You just want to spend more time with Caesar. And so, um... You're watching the story of Caesar rise and he's just trying to be free and free his apes. That's all it is. And it makes sense in that context. And you see Caesar's flaws in it. It sets up the sequels while making sense as a story in and of itself. This is how you set up a world and a franchise. This was done so well. Uh, I, I really love this movie. Hey, Johnny V. Can I call you Johnny? Not on your life. Well, sorry, man. Hey. Can I tell you about MoviePass? No! Okay, well I'm gonna tell you anyway. So MoviePass is the way I go see all my movies. Here's how it works. I pay $45 a month and they send me a card. Oh, that was dramatic. They send me the card in the mail and whenever I wanna go see a movie, I pull out my phone, open up their app, it's free, select the movie I wanna go see in their app, they put the money on the card that you kicked out of my hand, and then I swipe it and it covers it. It's really a great deal. So for $45 per month, you can go see as many movies as you want. Just a couple catches in there. First one, you can only see one movie per day. Second one, you can only see any one movie one time. But beyond that, it's just a great deal. But bad, partner. So if you're interested in signing up, please use the link down below in this video. You guys too. It does help out my channel, but this really is the way I go see all my movies. And I do recommend you check it out, Mr. Van Dam. You gonna do it? It's done. Wow, that was really fast. Hey, can I get a high five before you go? Ah! Ah, that was a kick, not a high five. But seriously, guys, it is the way I go see movies. I do recommend it. It's a good deal if you go see enough movies per month to warrant it. I've had a great experience with it, and I think you will too if it's the right service for you. If you're going to sign up, please consider using that link down below. It does help out my channel. With that said, let's get back to our video. See you next time. Coming in at number two for me is gonna be the one I saw last night, War for the Planet of the Apes. Now I just saw, I've only seen this one one time, I've seen the other, every other movie on this list multiple times, so perhaps in the future I'll move this one up and down, but I'm, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with this one is number two. And I, it's not, and that's not even to criticize it. This is a wonderful companion to, a wonderful follow-up to Dawn of the Planet of the Apes while being a book and a completion of what was started in Rise. And when I say all of that, it's a very nicely structured trilogy telling a story from beginning to end in these three parts leading up to a point in time that sets us up for the world of Planet of the Apes that we learned about in the 1968 film. 
It sets all these things up, brings us to a point, takes us on a journey with Caesar and seeing him rise in a true epic. And when I say epic, I mean that in the proper use of the term epic, not, not just like the superlative where you're just throwing out a word like praise. It's awesome. It's epic. When I say that, I mean, it's a type of story where you see a character rise to glory, freeing the people, going from being just a, a little... Uh, ape living up in an attic to being the leader of the new race of creatures that will reign over the planet. And he's the one that led them to their freedom, that conquered evil uh, and saved the people. But um, so this is a movie. Sorry, I got went on a little bit of tangent there of how wonderful Caesar is in his story arc is because I love it. In this movie, finish that out wonderfully. As a standalone movie, it tells a compelling story about the nature of war. Now, it's not a war film like Saving Private Ryan, it's not a battlefront film, but it's a war film in the sense of understanding war on the broader sense of it's it's normally not those are the bad guys and we're the good guys. It's two competing value sets, people that have a very reasonable reason that this culture values X and this value culture is Y. Everybody wants to live and they're trying to live in this world together where there's limited resources and there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion and there's emotions and each side has wronged each other. Each side has done things that would rightfully make the other side. We need to get them back. We need to make them pay for this. And along the way, that leads to an exploration of the nature of war, the explanation of the nature of humanity, our own hate, our own anger, the way that all of us need to think about how our actions affect other people, how I have to think about the people that have wronged us, have a perspective that led them to that moment. And it just explores so many ideas so wonderfully. And this is a really dire film with stakes that are heavy from the very opening scene of this to the inciting incident that happens shortly after that to the middle of the film to the end of the film all along the way this is a movie that at times feels hopeless there's a lot of sadness and they find a way to balance that with this bad ape character that's really funny that could feel out of place and they didn't they put him in a, a pit like just sprinkled him into a little bit of the marketing just enough that it made some of us go oh I hope that works. And you see the movie and it does that he fits into this world and the way they've established the way the apes work. He fits in so nicely into it. Um, and, he, and he adds an element that he breaks the tension that's there and that we're watching. If he wasn't in this, this movie might shift too far into the it's too dark. It's too burdensome on an audience to just sit through, just like soak in this dire, dark sadness of hopelessness. And you put this character in there that adds levity into it. It makes it a fun film and not a fun film. That's the wrong word for it. It makes it a film that has humor in it. It breaks the tension the way that humor used properly should without compromising the emotions that are supposed to be there. So it's used at just the right moments to break attention in a scene where you can do that. Um, and so overall, this was a great conclusion to the trilogy, a great continuation of the, of the film bef films before it. And uh, the only reason it's maybe like not on the top is a kind of a matter of preference in that the movie on top for me emotionally resonated a little bit deeper with me and perhaps somewhat because in this trilogy, parts two and three are the more similar of the films and Don got there first. And so I just have a certain bias towards it. With all that said, coming in at number one is going to be Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. This is one of the greatest sequels of all time. It's one of the most interesting films of all time in that it's a sequel to a rebooted prequel of whatever types of things, all sorts of labels to it that should make you go, this movie's gonna suck. This is not a good setup. Hollywood does not have the best history with doing movies like this. Then on the basic premise of it, a large chunk of this movie is apes on horseback with machine guns battling tanks. So that sounds pretty stupid. And they talk, so that sounds dumb. So many levels this movie shouldn't work. And it's, it's great. And it's a movie that I hope Hollywood learns from the success of these movies and that they have a rabid fan base. They were well received by the critics and they have been profitable that you can do big blockbuster spectacle films 
that are tragedies, that are dramas, that have real conflict, not just, there's an evil guy that we must stop. And to make the movie entertaining, let's just cr throw quips all throughout the movie and make it funny. You know, let's, let's uh, marvelize this whole thing and do the MCU tactic. We're just quip, 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 quip. I love the MCU, I love those movies, but not every movie needs to be that. And as, as a point of reference from a month ago, The Mummy comes out and it's like that. It tries to just quip, 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 trying to pour all that on top of it and it drowned the movie out. This movie is entertaining, engaging, people loved it. And it's a dark film, it's a sad film, there's a hopelessness to it. You're looking at a situation, like the opening scene of the movie is telling us, Everybody died after the last movie. All your favorite characters from that movie all that, that are human, they're probably dead. And the rest of the humans are probably going to die. And it sets up a conflict in the movie where you understand where everyone's coming from. Now, certainly you understand Caesar has his people and he wants to keep them safe. And his background lets him know humans can be good and humans can be bad. And I want to keep my people safe. And some of you, I don't want you humans to screw up my world, but I don't want to wrong you. So you understand his worldview. You understand Gary Oldman's. From the trailers, I was afraid Gary Oldman's character was going to be... Uh, too one-dimensional, and you see the movie, and he's not. You totally understand where he's coming from. He's justified in his fears, in his actions. There's misunderstandings, there's miscommunications, oh, and because the plot is, is so nicely structured together in such a wonderful way that they make his character someone that can be this angry guy that, like, we have to take these animals out, and he's not wrong for what he's saying as with the information he has from what he has seen. And then even Koba, the person in it that is the mustache-twirling evil villain person that just wants to kill all humans and is doing evil villainous things, you understand where he's coming from. Now, that's a lot of people say the, and I would agree with, the best villains are the villains that don't really view themselves as villainous, or they don't view themselves as villains, they just do villainous things. And therefore, that's what Koba is. This is a guy that was tortured by humans, was wronged by humans, has reasons not to like humans, and doesn't want to help the people that did everything they did to him. And he does villainous things because of that, does evil things because of that, as the hate overtakes him. And um, all of this makes for a compelling drama in that you understand where the humans, they're in this desperate situation trying to get out of it. And, um, uh, and it works so wonderful. I just love the way it works. It's kind of like the opening 15, 20 minutes, it's like they're setting up a series of dominoes and then you get to a certain point and it, the, in the movie and they hear music and every, it looks like everything's going to be good and you have a moment of hope and then it all gets pushed over and you see it all unravel, all fall over as Koba's plan goes out and the reason that it's, it's so hurtful and awful as he does what he's doing is because you just had this moment of hope where you could see the whole humans uh, Gary Oldman seeing his, his kids on the, the iPad and they have electricity and um they hear music and like, it's, it's, we might have it, we might have solved it. And then because of it, it all comes crumbling down. It's such a powerful moment. You have moments of triumph, though, even in this movie that feels so sad at times in seeing the rise of Caesar and being victorious and all that he does. This is how you do a blockbuster. I don't need all blockbusters to be like this. Don't take that message, Hollywood. Let's keep the fun, lighthearted MCU movies but please learn from this one and give us serious drama with competing values, real conflict, and great characters in Caesar. Probably my favorite character of the 21st century. I love this film. I love what they did with these trilogies. This one is my favorite Planet of the Apes film. But how about you guys? What are your thoughts on it? Tell me your ranking down below. If you've seen them all, tell me about all of them or whichever ones you have seen. Tell me down below. Let's get a lively discussion. And you know, if you, uh, the old ones just look so dated and cheesy to you. Are you the person that absolutely loves them and still thinks that 68 film is the best one? Let's talk about about it down below. If you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, these ranking videos, a couple of them each week. Each weekend, I put one out related to the big release of the weekend. And then in the middle of the week, I put one out that's just kind of related to a series I love or a series that you've recommended that I cover. So tell me what series you want me to rank down below. And as always, thank you for watching.